Before I started working at The New Yorker, I'd heard, of course, of the fearsome and intimidating re uh, reputation of the fact-checking department. And when I started there, I discovered that the reputation was not exaggerated. A colleague of mine wrote a piece about Paul Simon in which he described him walking along a beach swinging his arms. And the fact checker had called him during closing and said that she had confirmed that Paul Simon did indeed have two arms. <laughs> I wrote a piece in which I described the main street of a small town in California, and I described a small fountain surrounded by flowers and a store called Yogurt Bear. And the checker called Yogurt Bear and asked her to verify the existence of the fountain and the flowers. And the person in Yogurt Bear said, yes, it was there. Um, and the checker said, can you see it right now? And the person said, no, but it was there this morning. This was not good enough. So the checker called somebody else, two or three stores down from Yogurt Bear, until they found someone who could see the fountain and the flowers at that moment. That was good enough. Another colleague um, wrote a piece about James Brown, and we discovered that sometimes people just don't get it. The checker called James Brown's manager and ran some facts by him. And the manager said, well, I don't know, what did, what did your writer say? And the checker explained that she was calling to check up on the writer. And James Brown's manager said, well, but you don't trust your own writer? <laughs> there was some things that the, ch the checking department tried really hard not to get wrong. And one of them was telling, saying that someone was dead when they were actually alive. And this didn't happen often, but according to John McPhee, it did happen one time to a gentleman who was reading The New Yorker in a nursing home and discovered that he had been reported dead. And he wrote in very irate and asked for a correction, which of course the magazine um, supplied, except that then the man died over the weekends. And so by the time the magazine came out on Monday morning, there was yet another mistake. So. After a while, this began to affect me. It got under my skin. I began to feel kind of paranoid. I began to think things like, well, was it a fountain? Maybe it was just a statue. And maybe the flowers had been fake. I hadn't checked. And maybe the fountain hadn't been in California at all. Maybe it was somewhere totally different. And if I couldn't trust myself and my own memory, why should I trust anyone else's memory? And the world came to seem like a very uncertain, unstable place where fountains and flowers and even human arms might not be what they seem to be and could vanish at any moment. Well, but sooner or later it actually sunk in and I began to go native. And I began to feel with the fact checkers that pretty right or more or less true was not good enough. And I realized that I'd become actually quite insane on this point when I was in Japan and I was writing a piece about a monk who counseled suicidal people. And I spent many hours on the floor of his temple and I would ask a question, the translator would translate it, he would answer, and the translator would tell me what he'd said. Except it was not what he had said. I didn't know what he'd said. And I know this sounds really stupid and most people get over this in about five minutes, but I could not get past it. I didn't know what words he'd used. I didn't know if he talked colloquially or formally. I didn't know if he was being direct with me or if he was being kind of evasive. I did not know. And so when I got back to New York and started writing the piece, even though it was a long profile, I didn't use a single quote. Well, I wanted to look further into this business of evidence and how people believe what they believe. And so I decided the way to do this was to write a piece about the Loch Ness Monster. And I knew that William Sean, the late great New Yorker editor, thought that the Loch Ness Monster was the very worst subject in the world. Um, he thought the second worst subject was the future, but the Loch Ness Monster was the very worst. <laughs> but my editor also thought it was a pretty silly idea for a piece, but he indulged me. And I, was, I went to Scotland to write about a veteran monster hunter who was a patents lawyer at MIT and who had invented a kind of sonar in his youth, which he had been using to hunt the monster. And the reason he believed there was a Loch Ness Monster was that he had seen it himself, along with two other friends, one glorious afternoon in 1972. They had been having tea on the shore of the loch, and suddenly they saw something come out of the water ahead of them. They ran to get binoculars, and through the binoculars they could see this large, long shape, they estimated about 25 feet long, mottled and dark, like the back of an elephant. And they saw it move along the waters of the loch and then submerge. 
the, in the three years following, this monster hunter had taken three underwater photos of the monster, including one terrifying close-up of the monster's face, which were published in the British scientific journal Nature. So he thought he was getting pretty close. But while I was there, I met an, his antagonist, a monster skeptic. And this monster skeptic was that most obdurate brand of skeptic, the fallen believer. He had believed passionately in the monster since he was a child, and he had moved to Loch Ness to find it. And he had gone so far as to build himself a fiberglass submersible, submersible sphere with windows, and he lowered himself down 30 feet into the water, and someone pumped air down to him through a length of garden hose with a pair of bellows. This is how much he cared. But he gradually, over the years, he failed to find the monster and he became more and more skeptical and eventually he set out to prove that there was absolutely no monster. He had 30 boats in an unbroken line, trawl the loch, equipped with sonar, underwater sonar, trawl the loch from one end to the other and they found no monster. And so even though the existence of the monster had given joy and purpose to most of his life, he gave it up. And I asked him why he thought he didn't believe in the monster, and the monster hunter did. And he said, I am a man of science, and the monster hunter is a man of the law. And he thinks about proof in legal terms, which means, first of all, um, it's a matter of convincing most people that something is more likely to be true than not. And also, it's a matter of eyewitnesses. And there were many eyewitnesses who had seen the same thing that he had seen from the shores of the loch, and they, had, they were trustworthy, sober people who had, moreover, no reason to boast about seeing the monster because it was very ordinary to see the monster around there and it was, if anything, a little embarrassing. So you tended not to mention it. So he felt they would have been excellent eyewitnesses in a court of law. But the monster skeptic said, to be a scientist, it's not good enough to believe that something's likely to be true. You have to do your utmost to prove that it isn't true to try your hardest to make sure that hoping something is true has not led you to believe that it is true. And if you discover in the end that the world isn't what you wanted it to be, you have to let that go and that there, you have to admit to yourself that there is no Loch Ness Monster, however wonderful that would be. And he said, you think about these eyewitnesses and you realize that believing what you see is no more scientific than believing that the earth is flat. Well, a couple of years later, I discovered that there was a higher price for the standard of evidence than belief in the Loch Ness Monster. I was in India in the wake of terrible riots in Gujarat in 2002, uh, which killed something like a thousand people, most of them Muslims killed by Hindus. And I was taken to the headquarters of an NGO that wanted to show journalists that Muslim women had been raped by Hindu men. And they had about 20 women in their office and they sat me in a chair and they brought the women to me one by one and they told me stories, terrible stories, of how they'd been raped and they were translated for me. And the stories were almost identical but that could have been the fault of the translator, I didn't know. And it felt really inhuman to be a journalist at that moment because I wanted to believe everything these women told me because it was so brutal. And I knew that women find it very, very difficult to talk about rape and almost never make up such stories. On the other hand, I also knew that recently, before, another NGO with the op from the opposite side had coached several Hindu women to claim that they had been raped by Muslim men and these stories had been proved to be false. And there had been another story, an especially sensational and grisly one, of a Muslim woman who had been pregnant and raped, and then her stomach cut open and the baby ripped out. But this wasn't true. The doctor who did the autopsy on her body declared her to be intact. So I knew, I desperately wanted to believe these women, but I also knew that the people who had believed the false reports of rape had undermined the true reports of rape. And the people who believed women who told them that they'd been raped just because it seemed inhuman not to were creating the sense that rape was the kind of thing that could never be verified and was something you simply had to take on trust. 
And so I realized those fact checkers were right. And the longer I spent in Gujarat learning about the riots, the more I realized that even those things that seemed to be their most absurd and paranoid imaginings were also right. Because fountains can be destroyed and flowers do disappear and even body parts vanish just like that. Thank you.